Thank you so much for being here. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 190 is with Stacey Marie Ishmael from Bloomberg Crypto. Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. We we need more of you. And, and I'm glad you've got a podcast because as much as we think we know about cryptocurrency is as much as we know about podcasting. Because, I mean, I've lived that life where it's like you do a what? And and so and I think <laughs> cryptocurrency is the same thing where people are going, you got what? What is it? Is it money? What What is it? Even Howard Stern is freaked out by it. And that's a high bar to freak out Howard Stern. Um, <laughs> the thing I say about crypto is, you know, it's it's internet money, right? It's like, what if money weren't invented by governments, like, it, and weren't backed by, you know, the the United States or England, and instead came from computers solving math problems and people kind of getting together to say we want an alternative to these traditional systems of government and central banks and the whole idea of crypto this whole thing that's in the news all the time right now is less than two decades old you know it it really started up in 2008 2009 coming out of the financial crisis where people felt that they had been betrayed Mm -hmm. by by the banks and they had been betrayed by the government bailing out the banks and they were like we want an alternative is is that the reason why the government is is just consistently talking about it in the way they're going? How, how can we tax people on this? What what can we do? Because we we need to have control, and the best way to do this is to to make it look like it's the evil devil. There's a lot in there, so mm-hmm. I'll start with the tax part. Um, the governments around the world absolutely want to make sure they're not being left out of tax revenues on crypto because, you know, for a while, this was an asset class. It's very volatile, but for a while, it was worth like up to $3 trillion. Prices have gone down a lot, so it's gone down to, you know, below $1 trillion. But that's still a decent amount of pool of stuff sloshing around that governments want to make sure that they have a cut of. It's also that in a lot of cases, they have concerns about money laundering. Mm -hmm. They have concerns around, you know, the use of of crypto for crime. You'll hear like, oh, no, North Korean hackers are holding uh, some poor power station somewhere around hostage and they won't let them turn the lights back on unless you give them 10,000 Bitcoin. Like those have pop up and they are they are real and that does happen and so governments are concerned that you know there's this mechanism that criminals can use that is a little bit harder to trade if you roll up in a bank with a suitcase full of money and then they're worried about consumer protection right they're worried about people investing in an asset class that they don't fully understand and losing their savings and not having any recourse to get that back Mm -hmm. there are nba players that want to be paid in crypto money. I mean, is is that safe with the way that it goes up and down? Those NBA players have very smart agents mm-hmm. <laughs> and lawyers and talent managers. And one of the things about those is those are often like part of a marketing agreement with companies that provide crypto or provide crypto services. And most of them are looking at terms where they're like, even if you're getting paid in crypto, they're going to make sure it stays at the same amount as if you were getting paid in dollars, mm-hmm. right? So if you were, say, if you were going to get paid a million dollars, you're still going to get paid a million dollars worth of crypto, even if it moves up and down, which is the smart thing to do. So what do you do? You walk into a store and you say, I have Bitcoin, I'm buying this? <laughs> Uh, some stores, not not all stores, but there are actually places where you'll see a little sign and just like you will see like American Express, Visa and MasterCard accepted mm-hmm. here. Some of them will say Bitcoin accepted here. Mm-hmm. Uh, AMC, that movie theater chain, uh, is allowing people to, buy, to pay for tickets and AMC merchandise in, in different kinds of crypto tokens. If you use apps like Venmo, you can send your friends Bitcoin. This is every reason why people need to check in with your podcast, Bloomberg Crypto, because it really is going to help educate the, the normal everyday consumer. Because even when you walk into a grocery store today, those change machines, it says you can, you, you can send us your, your change and we're going to give you Bitcoins. Right. Yeah. There, there are ATMs that will allow you to do that. Yeah. It's happening. It's all around us. And that's the, that's got to be the reason why the UK would like to make it, you know, the, to become the, the hub part of the world when it comes to crypto. It's definitely one of the reasons, you know, the UK had a, a, a reputation for a long time as being a center of what's called fintech financial technology innovation. So I don't know if any of you or your listeners have ever, you know, banked in the UK, but it's a lot faster to send money to people. Um, I remember when I moved, I used to live in London and when I moved to the US and my landlord was like, I need to be paid in a check. I was like, what's a check? <laughs> because mm-hmm. in the UK, you don't use any of that. And so they're trying to make sure that they're reputation as being innovative and interesting and understanding you know money on the internet isn't overtaken by them not having kept up with crypto oh my god you bring up check i mean if i see somebody writing a check it's like whoa and it's <laughs> and it's usually the older generation that's doing it 
totally, totally. But you know, banking banking is very hard and it's very complicated, and for a lot of people, it's very expensive. You know, if if you're not a person who can afford to have a minimum amount of money in a bank account, for example, or you're facing overdraft fees, or you're having to resort to payday lending, something like crypto that says, "Hey, we're going to take all of those fees away, and this is going to be a lot easier," starts to get very attractive to you. Another thing that seems to be getting the attention of a lot of people, and it's only because the art world has jumped on it, is the NFT. I mean, it, that, that's another thing that a lot of people don't understand. And if you go and you Google it, it, it it's just it's like I, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, non fungible tokens or NFTs are. They're, if you think about them a little bit, it's really weird. But if you think about them a lot, they get even weirder. <laughs> so if you think about them a little bit, it's like, why would people pay money for digital prints or digital pictures of like monkeys or space aliens or any of these other other things? It's like, okay, well, that, that's art. That's fine. But why pay $75 million for it? But what NFTs actually are, are a contract, right? They, they're a piece of software that says you, the person on the other end of this, has certain kinds of rights. And for some people, those rights are, you have the right to own this picture of a, of a monkey. For some people, it's you have the right to listen to this piece of music. And whenever you play this piece of music, that musician is gonna get royalties, or this is a way for people to say, I wanna write a book, and I wanna give people the ability to crowdfund my book, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna write a smart contract or an NFT that says, if you crowdfund a certain level, you automatically become an associate producer. Okay. So there's there's actually a lot of very interesting code in these, but that's where it gets a little bit more complex. Well, it also gets really dangerous, doesn't it? And, and the question is, is that I realize the US government is trying to do whatever they can to protect the consumer, but there's gotta be people somewhere that, that really are protecting it. I think that there are fewer people really protecting it than you might think. Uh, This is an industry that's had a lot of hacks. It's had a lot of fraud. And, you know, sometimes fraud can be well-meaning, like people thought that they were doing something and then (laughs) they were doing something else. Um, And that's, that's that's a real concern. You know, if in the aftermath of the financial crisis, one of the things that the government did was say, hey, if you have up to $250,000 in a bank account and that bank goes under for any reason, we're going to make you whole. There's no like bailout insurance for crypto right now. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. But you know, there is a positive here though, is that uh, crypto is helping the people of Ukraine. Yes. The Ukrainian government did some very interesting things when Russia invaded. And just as a bit of background, you know, crypto was not popular in Ukraine. Like before the war, they weren't kind of going around and like having tea with people who were who were mining crypto. But when the war broke out, they realized that this was a potentially important source of revenue for them. And there are a lot of very important people in the crypto industry who are from Ukraine or have ties to Ukraine or have friends and family in Ukraine. And they raised hundreds of millions of dollars in donations of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other tokens in the space of just a couple of weeks. I have have a very good friend who's over there in Ukraine, and his mission as a journalist is to make sure that the money is being funneled to the right places. And my God, we've talked about the crypto over there, and and that it's, it's a very tough thing to follow as well. It, it can be pretty challenging. I mean, it's, it's challenging even when you're not in, in a war zone. And certainly that's always a question for people who are trying to do what's called like crypto philanthropy. You know, how can you make sure that if you send money to this string of numbers on the internet, that's like a really long version of a bank account, it actually ends up in the hands of people who need it. Mm-hmm. Venture capitalists. I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big word there for some people and they don't understand it because it, you know, you know, it's not in the everyday newspaper. Mm-hmm. What venture capitalists are, are mostly very wealthy individuals yep. or firms that have raised a lot of money that they want to invest in projects that have a high risk of failure and a very small risk of success. But if they succeed, they're going to turn into the next Amazon or Apple or Microsoft. <laughs> and so that's that's their bet, right? And so venture capitalists are like, okay, we're going to invest in 10 things, nine out of 10 of them won't make us any money. One of them will be the next Facebook. And so they've been very excited about crypto because they like that bet, right? They know that nine out of 10 of these things aren't going to work, but one of them is going to be the next Apple. Are we going to start seeing a lot more of these news talk stations instead of just talking about, you know, the Dow Jones and things like that? that they, 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 they're going to start giving us more of the, the numbers on that as well? Or is it is it that a lot of the talk radio stations are going, it's not investable yet. It's, it's still a guessing game. There is a real challenge to investability, you know, for for folks who might have a 401k, 
Um, there are people like Fidelity who are trying to give people access to Bitcoin in your 401k, which is a question for you and your financial planner. But there aren't a lot of mainstream available financial services products. There are a handful of things like exchange traded funds, which are, you know, like baskets of other stocks of things that are crypto exposed. But it's still pretty complex for the average person to say, I want to add some crypto to my portfolio in a way that's less risky. The podcast we're talking about is Bloomberg Crypto, which is now available on iHeart radio Let, let's take a company like iheart and let's just say that we're not going to give you direct deposit anymore we're going to pay you in bitcoin do you see something like that happening to businesses some people are really pushing to make that happen you know so in in, in new york our mayor mayor Eric adams is like i people should get to get paid in bitcoin if that's what they want and then a bunch of people were like we don't know if that was what they want slow your roll <laughs> but there there are <laughs> there are absolutely conversations that folks are having like that and actually there are people in other parts of the world where, for example, there's very high inflation, who think, okay, yeah, Bitcoin might be volatile, but like, have you seen the peso? <laughs> and so they think that getting paid in crypto is actually a better a better deal for them. And that's certainly a story that we're paying attention to. Well, look at El Salvador. They, they brag about being the very first ones to go all out. Yeah. El Salvador, back in September last year, became the first country in the world to accept Bitcoin as legal tender. So in El Salvador, if you want to pay for something, you can use either the dollar, because they're a dollar-based economy, or you can pay in crypto. In theory, in practice, most of the vendors and businesses in El Salvador don't want to transact in Bitcoin because it's like that volatility is imagine you're trying to sell somebody a sandwich and at the beginning of the transaction, that sandwich is going to cost five dollars and at the end of the transaction, it's going to cost ten. Like that, that's not something that people are really excited about having to deal with. I, I, I guess I'm such a, a skeptic on the, the crypto only because my financial guy for all of these years has said, no, nah, no, we'll come back to that later. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in the future. And so if, if, if he's not, you know, I mean, you see where I'm coming from? It's like, I, I want to do this, but it's like he's not saying, yes, you can do this. Yeah, and a, lo a lot of financial advisors and estate planners and wealth managers that we've spoken to, for them, the big thing is how do you mitigate the risk? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if you're a person who has like really large diversified portfolio of assets and you're like, I can afford to put aside X percent of this in something that might go to zero, then you might hear from your, your wealth manager or your financial planner like, OK, that's something to think about. But, you know, for a lot of them, it just doesn't seem like it's worth adding to that overall basket until there's a little bit more predictability about what you're signing up for. I keep thinking that Texas is going to, you know, become its own country and things like that. And so uh, when, when I when I read and I hear on your podcast, you know, that Texas, you know, is, is the top dog when it comes to bitcoins in, in the in the country. Yeah, I lived and worked in Texas for a long time, and it is a fascinating and misunderstood state, I would say. But Texas has a couple of things going for it. A very chill attitude to regulation. It has, you know, a lot of abundant energy, even though its energy grid keeps going down. And it has a political administration that's extremely pro-Bitcoin. And they've really tried to set themselves up as a place for people who philosophically believe in, in crypto to come, as well as people who want to mine Bitcoin, right? Which is basically setting up very large centers that have thousands of computers solving math problems, because that's how you make a Bitcoin, solve a math problem faster than their computer. And that seems to be working for them from the perspective of lots of companies are actually moving there. Uh, lots of crypto companies are actually moving there. The challenges will remain to be seen around how they make that sustainable, given how fragile their power grid is and the environmental considerations of that activity. So are, do, do they invest also in this thing called stablecoin or, or is that just going to be something for the Washington Nationals? <laughs> so stable coins, you know, we, we've used the word volatility a lot. We've said uncertainty. And what stable coins are supposed to do is, surprise, surprise, be stable, right? They're, they're supposed to right? stay at around a <laughs> dollar. And what the Washington Nationals found out is not all stable coins are created equal because they signed a sponsorship agreement with a company that made something that's called an algorithmic stable coin, which yeah. is not was not stable at all. And, you know, that, that coin is now essentially worthless. Um, I, my my colleague did report that the Washington Nationals got paid up front <laughs> before that all went pear-shaped, so they're, they're going to be okay. But stable coins are 
both interesting to people because of that stability, but also terrifying to governments because, you know, they worry that people will start to look at those as substitutes for their own currency. I, I watch people with the lotteries. I watch people with their stock market numbers and things like that. And But my biggest fear inside is what about the crypto addiction? I, I think that's authentic. We did an episode Thank you for being such a good listener of our podcast. We we did an episode about crypto addiction, which is very similar to gambling disorders, right? It's the idea that you get this rush, you get this high from winning or the possibility of winning or losing and then having the possibility of coming back from losing. And it's absolutely something that people are recognizing that is consistent with those kinds of more addictive or compulsive behaviors and that various therapists and other people who treat dependency and addiction are, you know, warning people to be careful about. So now do people like Zillow and things like that, do they, are they, are they into this or is it it's just one of those things where it's like, we're going to, we're going to grow in that direction. We just got to make sure that the platform becomes stronger. Yeah, I mean, the housing market in crypto is there's some very interesting stuff happening, interesting or scary, depending on whether you're a regulator or a speculator, Mm -hmm. because there are now companies that will allow you to let's say you you made a bunch of money in crypto, you have a bunch of money in crypto. Most traditional banks don't think of that as an asset. They're not going to be impressed by piles of Bitcoin. And so if you want to buy a house or, you know, like remodel your kitchen, you can't say, hey, I have all of this Bitcoin. Can we use this as collateral? They're just going to look at you like, no. Yep, yep. <laughs> but these native lenders, you know, the, these folks in the crypto space will say, yes, you absolutely can. You can use that as, you know, a down payment on a mortgage or something else. And I think there, we're definitely going to see places like the housing market and other sectors of the U.S. economy start to need to adapt to the reality of all of that happening. I, I was just in a really deep conversation with somebody about the metaverse and things like that, that we're going to be stepping into these little verses and, and, and crypto is going to be how we're going to create these worlds. And, and it's almost like we're going to, we're, you know, physically we're, we're here in this world, but mentally we're going into the metaverse and, and it's crypto that's going to keep us moving. Maybe. I, Maybe. The thing about the metaverse is it's existed long before crypto did, right? Oh. So I, I play a lot of video games. <laughs> Shout out <laughs> to anybody on there who plays video games. Uh, you know, I I have uh, like one of those VR headsets. Those are already really immersive worlds. If you have, you know, kids or family who play games like Fortnite, where you customize your avatar and you can talk to your friends, yep. but you're like a giant floating head in space, <laughs> that's very metaverse Because all the metaverse is, is a place where your digital identity feels as real as your physical identity. And those worlds exist without crypto. What people are also thinking about is like making metaverse spaces that have elements of crypto in them, like those non-fungible tokens. So imagine you have a really cool sword in Fortnite um, that you could, and you could bring that sword into another <laughs> game that you also play. That would be something enabled by an NFT. <laughs> Man, I love your podcast. I love that you're doing this because you are so full of information and you give us the opportunity to explore new ideas and to build new layers of trust. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening. Well, please come back anytime, Stacy. The door is always going to be open for you. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Maybe you can get on the show too. There you go. You'd be brilliant, okay? All right. Thank you. Y'all take care.